cartoonist, actor, poet, and only ten. This was the headline for the February 19, 1926 article about an artistic prodigy. Taught by his mother to play violin and piano, could speak intelligently about the symphony and opera by the age of five, George Orson Welles was born in Kenosha, Wisconsin to entrepreneur and inventor Richard Wells and coal heiress and concert pianist Beatrice Ives on May 6, 1915. Richard Wells was the co-founder of the Badger Brass Manufacturing Company, making his fortune as the inventor of acetylene bicycle headlight lamps. The family moved to Chicago by the time Orson was four. Soon after, Richard and Beatrice separated and Orson would live with his mother. In the time that he lived with Beatrice, he was set on a path to become a musician just like her. He debuted on the stage with the Chicago City Opera by the age of six in a production of Giacomo Puccini's Madama Butterfly. But Beatrice passed away when Orson was only nine, and he would set aside his musical performance career forever. After the passing of his mother, he lived with his father Richard, who traveled the world with his son before buying a hotel in Dixon, Illinois, which burned down, after which he took to the road once again and eventually died sometime between 1928 and 1930. Orson, while not returning to the musical stage himself, became a published preteen opera critic using his musical skill and flair for words to his advantage. An orthopedist, Maurice Bernstein, who would become Orson's legal guardian after the passing of Richard Wells, had convinced Richard to enroll his son in the exclusive and progressive Todd School for Boys in Woodstock, Illinois in 1926, where he was introduced to theater and would graduate in 1931 at the age of 16, qualifying for any college that wasn't too bothered about his poor mathematical performance. Using his small inheritance, Orson would move to Dublin, Ireland and act in the Gate Theatre there, having convinced the director that he was a 25-year-old theatre guild star, having been, at the time, six foot two and weighing over 200 pounds. He was a big boy. He was lent to the Abbey players due to his quick and wild success in Dublin, and even got into a petty shouting match with Noel Coward in a cafe over politics. Wells would say of the brief encounter, neither of us said anything in the least brilliant. He returned to the Todd School in 1932 to work as a drama coach and co-edited four volumes of Shakespeare plays with Todd School headmaster Roger Skipper Hill for the school's use. The two also co-authored works on how to teach Shakespeare to young people. In his first year back in the States, he would make attempts at being a playwright, none of which were terribly successful. New York producers enjoyed his work, supposedly, so they said, but didn't seem to think they would be commercial successes, so he was politely rejected. He left for Morocco to soothe himself and take a break and supposedly stayed with a friend he'd known in Paris, the Glowy, a Moroccan chieftain. Some sources say that's not true. I don't know. He may or may not have made that up. This is where he would work on his school editions of Shakespeare with costume sketches and stage directions for Twelfth Night, Julius Caesar, and the Merchant of Venice. It's called Everybody's Shakespeare, and within five years of its publishing, it had sold 90,000 copies. Not too bad. Speaking of Shakespeare, this is my Shakespearean insults mug. I love it. <laughs> Let's see. Clod of a wayward marl. I like that one. I need coffee, I'm sorry. Lump of foul deformity. All the infections that the sun sucks up. Various varlet that ever chewed with a tooth. Footlicker. Oh, here's another one. 
anointed sovereign of sighs and groans. Thanks, Bill. He returned to Chicago, and his dear friend and mentor Roger Hill introduced him to playwright Thornton Wilder, who recommended him to drama critic Alexander Wolcott, who in turn recommended him to Catherine Cornell, whom Wolcott had dubbed the First Lady of the Theater. Cornell immediately cast him in Canada as Marchbanks, and he would tour with her company for 33 weeks in that role, along with that of Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet, and Octavius, the brother of poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning, in The Barretts of Wimpole Street. If you're hearing any weird noises, that is probably my pellet stove. It makes noises as it runs. <laughs> anyway, that's how I'm heating my house that I am in, because I didn't want to bother with a space heater in my studio today. According to an unnamed troop member, Orson slept until noon most days, got into bar brawls, sprained his ankle numerous times, an oddly common ailment for him, and one which Roger Hill was convinced was psychosomatic, like any time he was bothered about something, his ankle would suddenly hurt. And he was scolded by Catherine Cornell once for wearing a false beard in public. I have no idea what that's about or why that would be a problem. But apparently that happened. In 1934, he returned to Woodstock to create a summer stock with Roger Hill. He invited two of his old Dublin compatriots, Michael McLemore and Hilton Edwards, to come make guest appearances. They were surprised to learn he was not the great star now pushing 30, but they came anyway to appear in his nine weeks of dramatic school performances. He also filmed a short film, The Hearts of Age, that summer at a firehouse. I watched it. It's bizarre and nonsensical and seems to have mostly been an experiment, just kind of playing around with the camera. So, that's cool, but it's weird. There doesn't seem to have been a story. It's just filming stuff. He was like 19. I did similarly dumb things. <laughs> it was during this time that Orson met Virginia Nicholson, a girl from an upper crust Chicago family who came to the dramatic school. They were engaged by the end of the summer and much to her family's objections, married at Christmas time. Their daughter, named Christopher, because Orson had been convinced she would be a boy, and apparently thinking that Christopher Wells was a musical name, was born March 27, 1938. Producer John Hausman saw Wells in his role of Tybalt for Cornell's 1934 production of Romeo and Juliet and went backstage afterward to introduce himself to Orson, signing him up for a leading role in a production of Archibald McLeish's Panic. He then got a $20 radio slot to pay his rent at West 14th Street and became so popular that he was able to move to a house at Sneedon's Landing, an extremely affluent neighborhood in Palisades, New York, just up the Hudson River from Manhattan. He was on the March of Time, playing current history characters, and was so busy that the elevator operator at the RCA building, now 30 Rockefeller Plaza, would hold the elevator for him to make it on time for his broadcasts. So he's running in and out, and the elevator operator seemed to know when he was coming and going, and would hold the operator. Hold the operator. <laughs> hold the elevator for him. Okay. In 1937, Hausman and Wells would found the Mercury Theater, an independent repertory theater company that would produce theatrical presentations, radio programs, and motion pictures. He then played the nebulous character The Shadow, a caped vigilante named Lamont Cranston, who would foil the plans of criminals by hypnotizing them to make himself invisible to them. This character was the narrator for the radio show Detective Story Hour in 1930, before being developed into a pulp magazine and then again on the radio in 1937 by Wells. The character was passed on to several other radio personalities, and lasted until 1954. And then the event that would change Orson Welles' life 
forever. October 30th, 1938, mass hysteria broke out in New Jersey when Martian spacecraft landed and strange beings began an attack. According to recently disclosed CIA reports, this real Area 51 was swiftly dealt with by the National and Coast Guard, and evidence was destroyed and records sealed for the last 80 plus years. People fled their homes in terror upon hearing the deep and steady voice of Orson Welles recounting his experiences of an alien invasion that he'd once read about in the novel War of the Worlds. <laughs> Leading up to Halloween, Orson decided he wanted to do a special broadcast for the occasion. His Mercury Theater on the air was getting ready for its 17th broadcast where they performed short radio dramas for a modest listening public of a few thousand people in the same time slot as the already beloved radio personality Charlie McCarthy, the ventriloquist dummy of Edgar Bergen on the NBC Red Network's Chase and Sanborn Hour. Orson and Hausman wrote and rewrote the Alien Invasion novel several times, making it more and more like a real-time news broadcast with each edit. They moved the half-time station break to two-thirds of the way in, the station break in which they would remind the audience that it was fiction. Did they think the audience would be fooled into thinking it was real? No. <laughs> no, they did not. Most likely. Today, the extent of the mass panic is disputed, and most now agree that very few of the small audience had been fooled by it. On Halloween morning, Orson woke to discover that the broadcast was national news, which still surprises me. <laughs> he read that people fled their homes and committed suicide to avoid facing the aliens. All fabrication, there's not really any record of that actually happening. But Orson didn't know that and had to sit down with reporters to explain himself. He said he was sorry for it and that he never expected that it would have the negative impact that it did not. He may have been secretly a little proud of having been so convincing, what a fine writing and acting job he had done. You actually convince people that an alien invasion is happening? That's impressive. Over the radio? Good job. He did initially believe, however, that this incident would be the death knell of his career. Mostly because, as was common at the time, newspapers across the nation had made up a giant scandal out of a few momentarily concerned citizens. The bulk of the hubbub was them calling authorities to check and finding out there was nothing going on, and that was it. So, yeah. Some commentators of the day said that what panic had occurred was due most likely to the raw nerves of a public constantly exposed to reports of impending war in Europe, and the concern that the invaders were not aliens, but foreign enemies. The month before, Hitler had started attacking the Sudetenland, the borderland of Czechoslovakia, claiming it is German territory. Sounds kind of relevant today somehow. The Munich Agreement, or as some would say, the Munich Betrayal, was signed off on September 30th, 1938, by the UK, France, and Italy. That's one month prior. So they signed it to cede the Sudetenland to Germany to avoid war. Hitler pinky promised to not claim any more territory. Like, I'm done, I promise. I just want this little sliver. And we all know how that turned out. Whether or not Orson intended on tricking his listeners will never be known for sure, and the broadcast is used to this day as an example of why one ought to be skeptical of news media. Orson himself said years later that he had hoped to teach people not to believe everything they hear on the radio, just like one shouldn't believe everything they read on the internet. <laughs> 
but his story on the subject changed so many times that it is the lesson of healthy skepticism in and of itself. And the fact that the newspaper industry used the hardly worth mentioning panic as a way to sell more papers during the Depression and disparage radio to get back what revenue it lost to the new medium, radio, is another lesson of the same. Just don't trust the media. At least not, you know, like 100%. Everything with a grain of salt. Just safer that way. Pro tip. The erroneous national news reports, while worrisome at first, ended up catapulting Wells to fame. He was a household name now. And he soon leveraged that notoriety to get into Hollywood. Tinseltown had tried courting Wells in the past, beginning as far back as 1936, receiving offers and scripts from the likes of William Wyler, David O. Selznick, and Warner Brothers Studios. But he was determined to make his mark on the stage. Until early 1939, after the War of the Worlds fiasco, when two of his plays, Five Kings and The Green Goddess, had flopped, and he desperately needed money. Offers from Hollywood apparently were still rolling in, but he didn't sign a contract with anyone until August of 1939, when RKO offered him creative control and the right to final cut of two films. They would approve the stories beforehand and take a preliminary lump sum for each and 20% of the profits. He transferred the production of his radio show to LA and began working on film proposals for the studio and called the studio the greatest electric train set a boy ever had. At this point, he was 24 years old. He began developing his first film and had no success for the first five months. The Hollywood Reporter declared that they are laying bets over on the RKO lot that the Orson Welles deal will end up without Orson ever doing a picture there. He managed to start pre-production on an adaptation of Heart of Darkness, which he'd previously adapted for a radio segment, but he couldn't cut the budget to the required 500000 and the project was dropped. European revenue was decreasing due to impending war, and the studio would not negotiate a larger stipend. The idea for Citizen Kane was then born, but Orson knew it would take a while to develop the story and write the script, so while he worked on that with his friend Herman J. Mankiewicz, grandfather to TCM host Ben Mankiewicz, he tried to mollify the studio by suggesting he shoot a political comedy thriller in the meantime, The Smiler with a Knife, adapted from a novel by Cecil Day-Lewis, father of Daniel Day-Lewis. A lot of super famous people today are related to super famous people of yesteryear. <laughs> anyway, that project, The Smiler with a Knife, also stalled and Orson and Herman began developing Cain in earnest. Wells and Mank, as Wells called him, seem to have come up with a basic idea for the film together, but the writing credits have been widely disputed since its making. Wells and Mank haggled over plot points for quite some time, and finally Wells gave Mankiewicz 300 pages of notes and waved him off to work with Hausman on the script. When it came time to make the film, Wells had final say on the entire process and tweaked, removed, or added things to his heart's content. Contractually, Mankiewicz was to receive no credit for writing as he had been hired as a script fixer. But when it came close to release the film, Mankiewicz fought for a credit. He threatened to take out full page ads in the trade papers and release an expose. He lodged a complaint with the Screenwriters Guild, but withdrew it. He continued to argue about it until the studio awarded him secondary credit after Wells, and the Guild followed suit until, according to Orson Welles' assistant, Richard Wilson, Wells had circled Herman's name and drew an arrow to place Herman's name before his own, and the official credit then read, Screenplay by Herman J. Mankiewicz and Orson Welles. However, Herman apparently resented Orson for the rest of his life. That's sad. <laughs> According to Robert L. Carringer, Carringer? <laughs> Carringer? I'm assuming it's Carringer. 
who sourced all seven drafts of the script and other related records from RKO for his 1978 essay, The Scripts of Citizen Kane, the full evidence reveals that Wells' contribution to the Citizen Kane script was not only substantial, but definitive. The authorship of the screenplay was hardly its only controversy. The barely likable, albeit entertaining, titular character, who is so ethically questionable as to not definitely be a protagonist, was heavily inspired by William Randolph Hearst. Who heard all about this from his snitch tabloid writer, Hedda Hopper, after she had watched the preview for it in February of 1941. Hearst began a campaign against the film, barring all of his papers from running ads for it and enlisting help from his friend Louis B. Mayer. Wells threatened to sue Hearst for trying to suppress the film and RKO if they chose not to release it. Hearst was particularly incensed over the character Susan Alexander Kane, assuming as many others that she was based on his young lover, Marion Davies, whose career he promoted and managed. Wells argued that Davies and the character were nothing alike, and that her story arc was inspired by Chicago businessman Samuel Insull with his building of the Chicago Opera House, and Harold Fowler McCormick with his promotion of his second wife's opera career. Insull had been deeply involved with Edison companies at the start of his career, and was later acquitted of selling worthless stock during the Depression shortly before his death. McCormick married a Rockefeller and eventually became chairman of the board of the International Harvester Company after marrying second wife Yana, Hannah, it's spelled with a G, Wolska, whose vocal prowess was thought not to be worthy of his hype. Due to Hearst's campaign against the film, its premiere was smaller than originally planned and the box office draw didn't make back the budget. It did better on re-release 15 years later. Orson being from the stage and radio and something of a creative savant wanted to experiment with camera angles and lighting styles and cinematographer Greg Toland was more than happy to join a project which allowed for techniques the other studios would not allow. Long continuous shots with incredible depth of field, low position cameras, high contrast lighting, and blocking such as one would see in a stage production were all techniques that were against established film conventions and is why the film is still considered to be revolutionary. It was considered the greatest film ever made by Sight and Sound magazine's International Poll of Critics from the time of its re-release in 1962 until 2012 when it was finally edged out by Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo. It also cast many fresh-faced actors who went on to have illustrious careers, such as Agnes Moorhead, Joseph Cotton, Nat King Cole, and Alan Ladd. Ugh. Sorry, I don't like having vocal fry, but when, I'm, when my voice is really tired, it comes out and I can't help it, and I keep getting this tickle in my throat that is killing me. So I'm trying to speak clearly, but it hurts. <laughs> Wells continued to be followed by scandal as around the time Kane, his very first film, was released, the FBI opened a file on him as part of the Dyes Special Committee on Un-American Activities, the precursor to the House Un-American Activities Committee, and their investigation into anyone and everyone they thought may be part of or friendly to the Communist Party. J. Edgar Hoover was concerned with Orson's membership in groups that were communistic in nature. The justification for that descriptor is pretty vague, so I'm sure you can imagine. Orson's projects for the Free Company dealt with civil liberty, racial prejudice, and free speech. Super commie. Another project they took note of was The Cradle Will Rock, a play written by Mark Blitzstein about corruption and corporate greed for the Federal Theater Project, which was sponsored by the Works Progress Administration, which was part of FDR's New Deal. You see, at the time, the feds 
we're not really getting along with the feds. The consensus was that Wells was simply too left-wing with, you know, all of his racial equity ideas and his creations, movies, stage plays, productions, were too subversive. Hollywood would quickly develop a bad taste in its collective mouth for the young, innovative filmmaker, and it was his desire to innovate that most bothered the industry. It was said of this habit of his, Whenever Orson Welles offends against the tricks of the trade, he is forgiven because his departures from the norm are regarded as calculated mutations which serve all the more strongly to confirm the validity of the system. Okay, sure. This unabashed individualism seems to be what most bothered the FBI. One report claimed that the cumulative evidence adds to the conclusion that Orson Welles' interests are entirely bound up with those of the Communist Party. The FBI was none too pleased with Citizen Kane either, and one agent authored a report that alleged the film Citizen Kane is nothing more than an extension of the Communist Party's campaign to smear one of its most effective and consistent opponents in the United States. That opponent? William Randolph Hearst. In 1942, Wells was preparing to leave for Brazil to film a three-story anthology about Latin America called It's All True. When the FBI received a letter making bold claims about Orson, such as whose American sympathies are nil and is known to be pro-Russian and paradoxically sympathizes with all men of the Hitler type who overthrow organized governments. The letter warned that Orson and his travel companions likely had nefarious reasons for the trip and ought to be investigated. They were, and nothing suspicious was found. One of Orson's compatriots even had the audacity to be Republican instead of a card-carrying communist. On February 22, 1945, J. Edgar Hoover sent an official order to the LA office to include Wells in the security index, which he said will contain only the names of those individuals who can be considered to be a threat to the internal security of this country. That's, that's where they're putting Wells' name. He was a threat to the internal security of the country. This order upgraded Wells to the status of communist. How happy for the FBI to have made this designation for him. The timing was curious, given his relative inactivity and their inability to prove his membership in any form of communist party. It did, however, come on the heels of his campaigning for FDR's fourth term in office and his increasing hints at a political run himself. They also made a big to-do about his infidelity to his second wife, Rita Hayworth, an issue that had resulted in the ending of his first marriage and his relationship after his first marriage to Dolores Del Rio, but probably <laughs> had nothing to do with his political leanings. In 1947, Wells and Hayworth divorced and things at the FBI seemed to be quieting down. Two years later, Wells was photographed at a restaurant with Palmiro Togliatti, head of the Italian Communist Party, which would have spelled trouble for him back in Hollywood were he not already blacklisted by this time and struggling to make movies in Europe. Orson was consistently facing financial woes as well. Special Agent R.B. Hood, who'd been on his case since nigh the beginning, finally recommended canceling Orson's security index card, and Hoover relented. He was completely and finally cleared in 1976. I should also note that much of the FBI's original sources were tabloid writers, most notably Hedda Hopper, favorite columnist of Hearst. Also, you can access most, if not all, of the FBI's file on Wells just by internet search. 
like on the FBI's website. You can find their archive and look it all up if you're into that kind of thing. Feel free. Orson once said, when you are down and out, something always turns up and it is usually the noses of your friends. An unfortunate thing to say, but one nose Orson could never count on was his own. He said of it that it had not grown one millimeter since infancy. It was simply too small a nose for a grown man's face, in his opinion. In almost every single film, Orson wore a false nose. Often ones he had bought or fashioned himself. In his TV appearances, like interviews, he did not, and he felt that he must look odd to viewers without one. In Kane, he had his naked nose on for the scenes of the protagonist as a young man, but he sensibly wore a prosthetic for the older Charles Foster Kane, as noses never stop growing, except his apparently. Bad news for folks like me, however. In The Long Hot Summer, <laughs> which was released in 1957, Orson's fake nose bleh, would detach from his face due to his sweating on location. Excuse me. Sweating on location in Louisiana. Paul Newman said about it, There's nothing worse than having someone start a scene and then the makeup guy comes over and starts picking and gluing your nose back on. Angela Lansbury recalled Orson's weight seeming to cause him problems, becoming overheated. Orson once joked about his weight, My doctor told me to stop having intimate dinners for four, unless there are three other people. All in all, it was a miserable shoot. For Ferry to Hong Kong, director Louis Gilbert recalled that Orson had sent ahead a parcel of noses, and it was mislaid for an entire day in a random post office. When they found them, Gilbert said they would have the makeup artist apply the nose for a screen test. Not only did Orson refuse to do the screen test, insisting the noses he had procured would work perfectly, he also refused to allow anyone else to apply them to his face. Gilbert relented, and when it came time to edit the film, he realized that just about every scene saw the nose in a different shape and position. To be fair, most of the time, his noses did work just fine. In a telegram to his personal makeup artist, Maurice Cederman, Orson wrote, Last year you showed me small, good-looking straight nose. This is what I need for Zanuck pictures starting two weeks. Stop. So far, only two Jewish noses arrived. Love, Orson. Maurice Cederman had been with Wells since Kane and was inventive and influential in the world of effects makeup. Arkeo's head of the makeup department had opposed Orson's demand for Cederman to get full screen credit for his work on Citizen Kane and insisted on getting the credit himself. Orson managed only to get both names taken out of the screen credit, but then took out full-page ads in the trade papers praising Cederman's work, calling him the greatest makeup man in the world. The film to which Orson referred in his later telegram to Cederman was either The Roots of Heaven or Crack in the Mirror, the only two of his films produced by Daryl Zanuck. In the film Black Magic, he had to be extra careful with his noses, as he'd forgotten his supply of them at home in Hollywood, and had to save the ones he had while a package of probosities was sent by post. Once finished with filming any of his movies, Orson would put away the noses for them in his collection, and he named the noses, although the names had nothing to do with the characters who wore them. His nose, for Touch of Evil, was named Sandra. King Lear's, which was made using the corner of a shoebox, was Sloan Jr. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think I turned into a rabbit a little bit. <laughs> Back in 1942, after Citizen Kane, Orson set about making what he thought would be a masterpiece. The Magnificent Ambersons as director and narrator. By all accounts, it is a fantastic film, but the film we know today was not the vision that Wells had in mind at all. He made the period drama about a high-class Midwestern family his own way to begin with, but after a very poor test screening, RKO decided to take the right to final cut away from Orson and assigned editor Robert Wise to fix it. Many scenes were cut, and the second screening was slightly more favorable. 
They changed the ending to a happier one and cut some more and released the mutilated masterpiece over an hour shorter of a film than the original runtime. Orson refused to watch it again until almost 40 years later and turned it off about halfway through, saying that from that point onward, it was RKO's film, not his. Composer Bernard Herrmann threatened a lawsuit if RKO did not remove his name from the credits when more than half of the score he'd written for the film was also cut out. Which makes sense. If there's no scenes for the music to play in, then there's not going to be the music, but I also totally get it from Herman's perspective, so... That stinks. He went on to co-star with Joan Fontaine in the fifth film adaptation of Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, playing the gruff and mysterious Edward Rochester. He signed on to the film mostly for the money to fund his next project, and reportedly had a difficult time being directed by anyone but himself. Fontaine compared Orson taking direction to trying to boss around an elephant. The year it came out, his relationship with Dolores Del Rio came to an end, and he married Rita Hayworth. Their marriage was volatile. He wanted independence, but needed her financial stability as one of the biggest box office draws of the day, and she wanted connection and family, having come from a controlling and abusive background. They had a daughter, Rebecca, on December 17, 1944. According to her older half-sister, Chris, she was a cute baby who looked just like their father. In May of 1945, Orson saw documentary footage from the Nazi concentration camps and set about making his next film, which would be the first commercial film to use the disturbing newsreels. In The Stranger, Wells plays the fugitive Nazi war criminal Franz Kindler, living under the pseudonym Charles Rankin, who finds a wife and a professorship in Connecticut before being tracked down by an agent of the United Nations War Crimes Commission, played by Edward G. Robinson. It was released in 1946. Wells had written in his New York Post syndicated column the previous May, No, you must not miss the newsreels. They make a point this week no man can miss. The war has strewn the world with corpses, none of them very nice to look at. The thought of death is never pretty, but the newsreels testify to the fact of quite another sort of death, quite another level of decay. This is a putrefaction of the soul, a perfect spiritual garbage. For some years now, we have been calling it fascism. The stench is unendurable. Three of the four scenes of camp liberation in the film were from Nazi concentration camps, an assemblage of films used as evidence in the Nuremberg trials. Wells had a four-film contract with International Pictures, but they backed out after The Stranger was completed, possibly because it was believed that the film would not make money. However, it would be Orson's only box office success grossing more than double its production cost in the first six months. In March of 1946, Rita separated from Orson and moved into a rented house with their daughter. The two reconciled for a short time to make the film The Lady from Shanghai, but it was short-lived. Orson was too obsessive over his work, and according to Rita, on the stand in their divorce trial in 1947, Mr. Wells showed no interest in establishing a home, Mr. Wells told me he should never have married me in the first place, as it interfered with his freedom in his way of life. And that was that. He was ordered to pay $50 a week in child support, and Hayworth would go on to sue him for $22,450 in unpaid child support in 1958. Their daughter, Rebecca, didn't see her father very often. She would visit him in Europe on occasion, but was bounced around different boarding schools and summer camps across the world as her mother remarried several times and battled depression, alcoholism, and what is now believed to have been undiagnosed early-onset Alzheimer's. Older sister Chris has similar memories of being often separate from her father, but she remembered Rita as being a loving stepmother for the few years that they were in each other's lives. And both Chris and Rebecca seem to remember Orson as being a doting father, the little that he was around. 
1955, Wells met actress Paola Mori, an Italian aristocrat, on the set of his film Mr. Arkadin, and after a whirlwind romance, they married on May 8th of that year at her parents' insistence that November, their daughter, Beatrice Giudita Wells, was born. Her first name was for Orson's mother, Beatrice Ives. Unlike her two older sisters, she was raised by Orson and her mother together as they never divorced. She went on to help restore his films, protect some from changes as manager of her father's estate, and even finished some of his unfinished work. Another of Orson's films that was influential in the art of cinematography was Touch of Evil, a 1958 noir based on the 1956 novel Badge of Evil by Whit Masterson. Orson wrote and directed it and played crooked police captain Hank Quinlan. The film opens with a long single take and later has a 12 minute long single take tracking shot, a technique practically unheard of at the time. The film that Wells considered to be his best of all time was The Trial, which he made in 1962. It was based on the 1925 novel of the same name by Franz Kafka, which was published after his death, and is where we get the term Kafka Trap for the phenomenon in which a person is accused of an unspecified crime and their denials are taken as proof of their guilt. It was during filming of The Trial that Orson would meet Olga Polinkas, whom he would give the name Oja Kodar. She became a companion to him and would remain with him for the rest of his life alongside his wife, Paula. The trial's reception was mixed. Wells had planned to first release it in September of 1962 at the Venice Film Festival, but he was not done with his many and meticulous edits so he finally premiered it that December in Paris, and the French seemed to love it, awarding it Best Film from the French Syndicate of Cinema Critics in 1964. Film critic Leonard Maltin later gave it likely the fairest review of all, three and a half out of four stars, and saying that it was gripping, if a bit confusing, not for all tastes, which is pretty much true of everything, so. Malton didn't exactly go out on a limb with that review, but it's also not unfair, so <laughs> that works. Orson Welles was a fiercely unique and polarizing personality. He had plenty of character flaws shown in his interpersonal relationships and occasionally mirrored in the characters he played. He once said, For 30 years, people have been asking me how I reconcile X with Y. The truthful answer is that I don't. Everything about me is a contradiction, and so is everything about everybody else. We are made out of oppositions. We live between two poles. There is a Philistine and an Esthete in all of us, and a murderer and a saint. You don't reconcile the poles. You just recognize them. As for his career choices, he said, I'm not rich, never have been. When you see me in a bad movie as an actor, I hope not as a director, it is because a good movie has not been offered to me. I often make bad films in order to live. Because he so often wished to make his films fully under his own control and discretion, many went unfunded and unfinished or finished years later, all in all adding up to 24 projects that were halted for a while or forever. On October 9th, 1985, Orson recorded a TV interview on the Merv Griffin Show, appearing with biographer Barbara Leeming. Wells returned home to work on stage directions for a project he would be filming the next day, and sometime in the early morning hours of October 10th, he died of a heart attack at the age of 70. He was discovered later that day by his chauffeur and was cremated. There was a small private memorial and all three of his daughters attended the first time they had all been together. Old friend Joseph Cotton refused to attend any service, saying later that Orson did not want a funeral. Instead, he sent along a message with two lines of Shakespeare's Sonnet 30. But if the while I think on thee, dear friend, all losses are restored and sorrows end. 
Wells' ashes were interred two years later in an old well in Aranda, Spain, on the estate of Wells' longtime friend, Antonio Ordonez. And that is a lot of, but definitely not all, of the story of Orson Welles. I did not add, should have, there wasn't really a great place to put it. You can find it pretty easily, the information about it. Supposedly, Orson also had a son by a different woman who lived, I think they were next door neighbors back when one of his daughters was a child. I think Beatrice, or maybe Chris, either Chris or Beatrice. Supposedly there was a DNA test done and it was inconclusive. I don't even know if that's true that that happened, that there was a DNA test performed. And then also like after he died, I think, after Orson Welles died. It was inconclusive if there was one. And also, someone apparently figured out that Orson was in a different country than the mother of this guy <laughs> that I don't remember the name of at the time that he would have been conceived. So, uh, but I thought I'd throw that out there because it's kind of relevant and someone's probably going to come at me if I don't mention it, so... There you go, I've mentioned it, uh, I don't know. He definitely had a lot of indiscretions in that realm, so, you know, I guess. Well, it is four in the morning and I'm starting to really, really feel it. So I'm gonna be done, I'm so sorry about, you know, it being months, but that's just how my life has gone recently, so. Yeah, it's been a lot. I've just been super busy and not necessarily so busy that it would make sense to some people that I haven't been doing this, but it just hasn't worked out. There's been time but not time for this necessarily, and that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> okay, so tune in next time. Hopefully it won't be another like six months. Yeah. All right. I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye. Keep the hair that stay out of my face. Okay. To work as a drama coach and constantly exposed to res to res sports. We're sportsing again. We're re sportsing. And that her story arc was story arc. Yeah. Wells was preparing to leave for Pri Brazil. Oh! Most notably, had a hopper. Favored column. Column. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I'm gonna try that again. Oh, awesome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, okay. <laughs> the teeth. Da 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 da